Welcome to Life in Biology. This is Dr. Joel Graff, and uh, this lecture, uh, this is the 11th lecture in the series. It's on membrane transport, and then we're going to switch into enzymes towards the end. So there's kind of two topics built into this one. And uh, this was lecture material. These are overheads that I drew for a class that was given on Monday, uh, February 7th, 2022. Okay, so these are, uh, we, we are on the topic of membranes. We had just talked about hypotonic and hypertonic and isotonic and all that. Um, so we just did a quick review of membranes, the fact that they're phospholipid and the fact that they're semi-permeable. So in this review, we saw that we had polar head groups and then there were fatty acid chains coming off the polar head groups for each phospholipid. And so there is one phospholipid here, a second one here, they're connected tail to tail, the fatty acid tails are pointing towards each other, which makes the head polar and because of the phosphate group, and it makes the inner side uh, hydrophobic because it's those fatty acid chains made of mostly carbons and hydrogens. So the hydrophobic core, this is the most important part when we're discussing the idea of uh, phospholipid bilayers being semi-permeable. So what can pass through? Well, if it's small and hydrophobic, nonpolar, then things like oxygen and CO2 can pass through. What about if it's really large? Well, maybe. Uh, if it's very hydrophobic and not super huge, you can have molecules go through. So an example of that is when we are learning about the different uh, fat, uh, different categories of lipids. One category of lipids was the steroids. And so the steroids uh, are fairly large molecules, but they're not super huge. And so the steroids are something that can pass through the cell membrane because they're mostly nonpolar, uh, or the majority of them is nonpolar, and then uh, they're not too big. So what can't pass through a semi-permeable membrane? Well, that would be small hydrophobic uh, are hydrophilic and polar. Uh, I realized later that there's only one L in hydrophilic, so uh, just take note of that. I misspelled a word. Um, so what are some things that are small and hydrophilic and polar? Well, water is a good example of a polar molecule. Uh, ions, these are just single atoms, so you can't really say that they're polar, but they do have a charge, and so in that case they're hydrophilic because they're okay interacting with water. Then other things that can't pass is if they're large and polar, and in this case you need a channel or a pump, and we introduced that last time, uh, but we're going to delve into that a little bit more. So channels, they can be they are they allow for passive movement of material across a membrane and the channels can also be gated channels so they can be opened or closed meanwhile pumps um, they do work uh, as the name might imply and so then they're going to typically require energy like ATP to get things to move across uh, the membrane of a cell Okay, so here is a membrane, and I've got lots of different proteins uh, interacting with or embedded or whatever with the membrane. So the first thing I want to point out is the different ways that membranes can be situated, or different ways proteins can be situated in a membrane. So here, the black ovals and circles, uh, and I guess other shapes, uh, are going to be the proteins. So in this case, like a channel, these proteins go the full span of the uh, plasma membrane, and, and so they are considered transmembrane proteins. They go across both layers of the phospholipid. You can have proteins that are embedded, and so by embedded, they must have some hydrophobic part here and a hydrophilic part here, and then they like to sit in the membrane. And then the third type of uh, protein the, uh, interaction that we can have with the membrane is where a protein is associated with the membrane, but it's not. But this, the protein itself is either fully outside the cell or fully inside the cell, and the protein will have some sort of an anchor. In this case, I drew an example where it's a lipid group. And so if a protein is post-translationally modified so that a lipid group is attached to that protein somewhere, you're going to have that lipid group not want to be involved 
or interacting with water. And so this would be happiest, in air quotes, if the uh, lipid group was buried into the phospholipid bilayer so that its hydrophobic part could be covered there. Okay, so with channels, again, we covered this last time, but the flow of material is by diffusion. It's passive. It does not require energy, but we can gate it. So we can open and close the spigot, so to speak. In this next one, uh, this is an example of a pump. And so uh, the in this case, the pump is kind of open so that it's open to the, if this is outside the cell, it's open to outside the cell. And then you can have some molecules uh, sit down into some sites on the pump. What's not shown is that the pump can change its orientation. So it uh, goes from being kind of a V shape to an A shape. Um, and when it, when it forms that upside down V, that allows the two molecules that were sitting here to then escape onto the other side of the plasma membrane. So this is being pumped across and it usually uses energy. Uh, so this would be considered active transport. And then a third type of way that molecule, molecules can go from one side to the other is uh, through carrier proteins. And in this example, this, uh, this is an E with a negative sign. It's supposed to represent an electron. An electron can be uh, grabbed by an electron carrier protein, and the electron carrier protein could then pass the electron onto another protein that's an electron carrier protein, and then the electron can end up being put out on the other side of the plasma membrane. But an electron is extremely small, but because it's charged, it's not going to be happy at all within the plasma membrane, so it's not going to want to be able to just pass right through. We're going to come up uh, come across these electron carrier proteins when we discuss photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Uh, chemical reactions where electrons are shifted about um, are called redox reactions, which is short for reduction oxidation. And I'll save the majority of that for late uh, discussion for later. But anytime you've got electrons being passed around as part of the uh, chemical reaction, it's called redox. Uh, and then just as a heads up, uh, our blood is, the blood in your body is red if it has oxygen in it, and it's blue if it doesn't have oxygen, and it has to do with the redox state of the iron. Okay, so if it's oxidized, it's going to be red. If it's reduced, it's going to be blue. Okay, so what about moving really large things across the membrane? We, we've accounted for talking about small and medium-sized molecules, but what about really big things? How can you get those across a membrane? And I'm, we're going to discuss three different ways you can do that. And this falls under the title of bulk transport. In our first example, it's the action of eating or phagocytosis. Phagocytosis can be translated to the action of eating. And here you have some sort of a cargo. I usually think of it as a bacteria because I used to study macrophages, which are cells that would go around and eat bacteria. Um, and let's say it's a let's say it's a bacteria. What happens is that the macrophage would extend uh, the lipid on its surface to where it would be going out. Uh, higher than it would normally be if it wasn't contacting this bacteria and then it would just keep pushing until those ends of these uh, of these uh, protrusions would meet up and so then what will happen is once those protrusions meet up the membrane can fuse and thus we have basically a bubble blown into the cell and it'll look like this where we've got the bacteria within a bubble and the outside of the cell looks normal again. So just in your mind, kind of animate this until those are extending and connecting, and that will allow that bacteria to go into that. Those vacuoles are called endosomes. If it is a bacteria or something like that, it's called a phagosome, but a phagosome is a type of endosome. Okay, on to number two. Let's say a bacteria contacts a cell, but instead of the cell reaching out and eating, Instead, it basically inhales it and just sinks, and the bacteria will then go lower and lower and lower. And eventually, as it goes low enough, then the sides of the membrane can then reach, will then come, uh, 
be pushed around the entire bacteria and they will then seal themselves up and basically this is an even better example of like blowing a bubble in inside of another bubble okay so again it looks the same whether it was phagocytosis or endocytosis if we were able to look at all the proteins and everything it might be we might be able to pull up some differences the final way doesn't end up with a molecule like this instead it's when smaller cargo uh, is or in this case small cargo is um, thinking of particulates they might be out in the fluid around the cell and the cell might just start uh, invaginating to begin with it doesn't need a bacteria sitting on there and causing a signal instead the cell is just drinking so this is called pinocytosis I don't have it written here but p-i-n-o-c-y-t-o-s-i-s -I -I so it's the action of drinking phagocytosis was the action of eating pinocytosis is the action of drinking and as it pulls those in and those bubbles come here now you've got small molecules but it's nothing no big cargo it's just any small molecules that were outside the cell eventually these might look something like this because what will happen is the molecules that are within an endosome endosomes become mature and they actually have ph drop they become more acidic and they have, have enzymes become active and they'll chew up what it was ever whatever was in that uh, uh, endosome okay so those are your examples of bulk transport that was the end of our discussion of how you can get things from outside the cell to inside the cell whether it's through the diffusion whether it's through channels or pores or whether you have to do bulk transport Okay, so now it's time to switch over to talking about enzymes. Enzymes are uh, generally proteins that can be RNA, but generally proteins that will speed up chemical reactions. So if you have a chemical reaction, you might start with a couple molecules, and we'll call the molecules you begin with substrates. Those molecules will go through some sort of a chemical reaction where bonds uh, are broken or... or, or um, formed or electrons are passed around uh, something like that um, and then it's something to do with electrons whether they're shared or uh, completely transferred and then you end up with a product and so if you started with the substrates a and b uh, you they could interact form and break some bonds and then you have two different molecules at the end okay so we're going to be talking about enzyme kinetics in lab that week and this is how fast can an enzyme speed up a reaction so we're going to see that because enzymes are proteins and proteins require a interesting three-dimensional structures to do their jobs uh, there could be situations where the enzymes don't act very fast if they get bent out of shape so to speak okay so the enzyme that we're going to study in lab is called catalase. Now the catalase uh, will take a couple molecules of hydrogen peroxide and will cause it to break down into two molecules, two being water and another oxygen. And so then we have, I balance the reaction, so you need two hydrogen peroxide, two water, and one oxygen. And if you add up the number of hydrogens on both sides and the oxygens on both sides, it's going to be balanced. But anyway, the enzyme's called catalase. I underlined the ACE, A-S-E, because a lot of times enzymes end with the letter A-S-E. And this will cause the hydrogen peroxide to break down very fast. Um, it says not a balanced reaction here, but I actually um, I actually did balance it, so ignore that part. Okay, so let's take a look at what the enzyme's doing. So last time we had a substrate, let's say it was hydrogen peroxide. You have your enzyme, let's say it's catalase. I draw it, I draw it like Pac-Man. We usually just draw a circle for a protein, but here it's a Pac-Man because we want to be very specific and show this special spot on the enzyme called an active site. Now the active site is going to be kind of like a lock and key fit with the substrate. 
It's not quite exactly the same opposite shape as the substrate surface, but what happens is that if the substrate goes in, you start to have interactions between molecules that were on the surface of the active site and molecules that are on the surface of the substrate, and those interactions will then cause an even tighter fit. It's called an induced fit, and this is where the enzyme clamps down on the substrate. And so it'll cause a shape change to the substrate. And by making that shape change, it's adding some energy to the substrate. And we're going to talk about thermodynamics soon. But basically, in this case, you could think of it like teeth chomping into a bite of food. And so then you're going to break the food into smaller pieces. So you have the substrate here, and we end up with two products from this reaction. Again, if this substrate was hydrogen peroxide, we would have some water and oxygen being the products. And then the enzyme's back to normal, and so it's ex essentially the same as it was here. So enzymes are involved in a chemical reaction, but they do not get altered between what they s the starting state and the end state of the protein. They might change shape for a second, but then they rebound and they come back and they're ready to do it again. So when, an, uh, when a catalase speeds up the reaction of uh, breaking down hydrogen peroxide, it's that each catalase molecule chews, takes one bite, one bite, splits the hydrogen peroxide, releases it, goes and bites another one, releases it. So it's just bites and spits out, bites and spits out over and over and over again, but it never changes. Nothing about the enzyme changes. Okay, so basic thermodynamics. This is uh, a figure where it really helps to draw in order um, or, or walk through it in order. So I'll tell you about how the order that I drew it. Well, thermodynamics are often drawn uh, with a y-axis and an x-axis. The x-axis is going to be the progress of the reaction. So if we have substrates at the beginning of a reaction and products at the end of the reaction, we usually draw the substrates at the left side and the products at the right side. And then um, on the y-axis, it's energy. So we've got two types of um, two types of reactions. We can have reactions where energy is released or ener where energy is introduced to uh, so that the substrates will go down in energy or the when they are the product or the substrate can go up in energy. And so we're going to see lots of examples of both of those types. But again, here's our hydrogen peroxide and down here is our water and oxygen. And if the uh, substrate could just spontaneously go down to the product. Um, an example of this is if something were to just catch on fire, um, you would cause uh, a lot of heat to be released all at once and, and it would light on fire. Um, whereas if you don't have it spontaneous, you can have hydrogen peroxide can be stable and sit on the shelf for a while and it'll take a long time before it turns into water and oxygen. So the reason that it doesn't just go straight from hydrogen peroxide down to water and oxygen is because there's an activation energy. So for this hydrogen peroxide to break, you have to introduce energy into the system, uh, get up to a certain point, and then it'll cause the act. Then it can go down the slide. What an enzyme does is it reduces the activation energy. And if you remember this induced fit thing, what it's doing is that it is changing the shape of the hydrogen peroxide so it's closer to being the broken form. And by changing its shape and putting it right on the edge of being a broken form, uh, it's, uh, you will have it break down faster than if you did not change its shape. Okay, so the activation energy gets lowered when you have a catalyst, and in this case, the catalyst is an enzyme. Okay, so enzymes speed up the reaction. Um, reactions can be uh, release energy or take in energy. So exergonic or exo, 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 uh, yeah, exothermic. Uh, I'm not using these words correctly. Um, if we say uh, exergonic and endergonic, that's energy is released or energy is, is entered. Um, those would be opposite types of reactions. 
a lot of times the energy that's released is in the form of heat so you might hear of an endothermic or exothermic experiment or a reaction in the case of hydrogen peroxide going to water the hydrogen peroxide will go down in ener energy level to these and so energy is released so if you combine some hydrogen peroxide with a bunch of um, catalyst it will warm the solution will warm up um, this is what the old elephant toothpaste little experiment demonstration is and if you go touch the elephant toothpaste immediately after the reaction happens it'll be warmer than it was before the reaction started okay so enzyme details so enzymes again they can be um, they can work faster or slower and in the lab we talked about a uh, pH or temperature affecting enzymes another thing that can affect whether an enzyme works efficiently or not is is that there are a subset of enzymes that can be either an apoenzyme uh, which is not very efficient or a holoenzyme uh, which is more efficient so this is not very efficient and this one works much faster now what is the difference apo means alone so this is the protein alone uh, hollow means the considering the whole or a complete uh, enzyme and the difference is this little eye on our pac-man that little eye on the pac-man was some sort of a molecule which is known as a cofactor so if a if the if a cofactor comes along and binds to the hollow enzyme or, uh, binds to the enzyme so that it is a hollow enzyme um, it'll work faster a good example of this we've been talking about different polymerases when we we're talking about DNA and RNA and those polymerases require magnesium so an example of a molecule that can be a cofactor is uh, an ion like magnesium and that was it for that day of lecture so again this has been life in biology I'm dr. Joel Graff uh, like and subscribe